Welcome everyone to Humane Voices, the official podcast of the Humane Society of the United States. Carrie and Austin here for another episode. Carrie, how are you holding up? Any more accidents from floof? Any more shenanigans? No more floof accidents right now. I, I, I do feel like, you know, the sort of ongoing thing we have about how are you holding up, how are you holding up. I really hope that we were able to give a different answer at some point soon and we're able to say, I'm out of my house. Everything is great. I'm romping with my dog. I'm interacting with other humans. That would be amazing. Because <laughs> right now I keep noticing that you've got Gustav Klimt in the background uh, there and I, I keep feeling that we really need to replace that with the stream because it's, yeah. I, I need to, every single time, every different episode, I could do another Klimt. Oh, I love That's it. A, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or just switch out just different animals looking looking uh trapped and 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 like help yeah that, that, that's a help great us, idea help us. yeah no we yeah we're i should really stop asking those questions we're in the the same cycle over and over again i'm i'm just seeing you know it's just here in the grocery store um, yeah exactly how are you stuff. austin how are you carrie i'm exactly the same how are you oh <laughs> right. I'm exactly the same yeah it's another cycle um well i what i wanted to do is introduce our guest for today Oh, you know what? I'm sorry. I'm getting a lot of interference here on the microphone, so I'm going to have to push this out of the way. Um, just give me a moment and uh, I will unplug and we'll get things going again. So for today, we have uh, our, our special guest, Kathleen Summers, who is with us. She's the Director of Outreach and Research for the Stop Puppy Mills campaign at the Humane Society of the United States. Kathleen, thank you so much for sitting down to chat with us. We're really, really glad you're here. Definitely. Thanks for having me. How are you holding up, Kathleen, since we haven't asked you before? Oh, well, you know, I'm kind of a homebody, so uh, I've got my books here and my dogs and my family. You're porn thriving. My puzzles. Yeah, <laughs> I'm kind of happy. <laughs> well, it's, it's great that, that you're here for today's episode. Uh, we, it's, it's fairly timely, too, because we actually just put out a report. So before we get into that uh, interesting discussion, in your own words... How would you describe a puppy mill to someone hearing it for the first time? Well, a puppy mill is an inhumane commercial breeding operation where the dogs are kept solely to make a profit for the owner to sell to the pet trade. Um, so they, there's very little concern given to their health and welfare and um, things that they need, such as cleanliness and veterinary care. And there are a lot of these, right, Kathleen? I mean, part of the reason that we're having you on today is because recently the HSU has released this, this report that we do called the Horrible Hundred. Can you talk a little bit about that and exactly what that is and why we do it and what it tells people about the industry? Sure. There, there are about 10,000 puppy mills in the U.S. Um, every year, our researchers comb through thousands of pages of inspection reports, um, both federal and state inspection reports, and we look for problem puppy mills that we think um, the world needs to know about. And we put them in our Horrible 100 report uh, to, to warn people about the types of puppy mills that are out there. It's definitely not a list of all puppy mills or even all the worst puppy mills or anything mm -hmm. like that, but they're uh, puppy mills that um, we think are examples of uh, puppy mills that people should watch out for, examples of places that are not being well regulated, and we're calling upon the public to be careful about where they buy a puppy, and we're calling upon enforcement agencies to do a better job of, of finding, citing, and in some cases shutting down these facilities. So when you're drawing, so these, these horrible hundred mills, like one of the things that I would be curious about is how do you guys know, like, what do, what do you do to find out that these are, these are bad and, and particularly icky places? Like what's the process there? And has it been, has it been challenging? I mean, is that, is that tricky? There's unfortunately a lot of candidates every year. Um, mostly we rely on inspection reports um, from the USDA and from certain states that inspect. Um, we also do have some undercover uh, footage and undercover investigation materials, as well as public complaints about sick puppies. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, Kathleen, do you ever have any issue with like, I would assume you have to do like a lot of FOIA polls and reports. Do you ever get any pushback or it, it, does that take a while or are there a lot of barriers in that information gathering process? Yes, well, I think the biggest, the most well-known barrier was the USDA data purge, which happened in February, 2017 when uh, the new administration abruptly took all the animal welfare inspection reports off of the USDA website. Um, that was a huge overreach. 
Um, the public has a right to that information. We have a right to know how our tax dollars are being spent when it comes to inspecting puppy mills. Um, so those, um, those reports were unavailable to us for uh, almost three years until Congress directed the USDA to put those reports back online and they uh, were replaced in February. So we were able to, for the first time in several years, we were able to release our report with a full list of, of identities attached. Mm, that's great. So when, one thing that I'd be really curious about, when, when you guys are talking about puppy mills, like, is there a particular thing that makes a puppy mill a puppy mill versus, say, just a person who breeds a lot of dogs? Or is it, is it, about, is it about number of animals or is it about the conditions or is it sort of a combination? Well, it's mostly about conditions. Um, you know, there are some people who say, well, I, I didn't buy my dog from a puppy mill, but I, I bought him from a backyard breeder. And mm -hmm. when I went there, I realized that the conditions weren't very good and the person had a row of cages in her backyard and um, the, they were dirty and the animals didn't have much space to move around. Um, in a case like that, that's, that's a backyard puppy mill. Um, mm -hmm. If the animals yeah. aren't getting good care and they're just being bred um, to produce puppies for the pet trade. They're not pets. They're not taken good care of. Um, it is a puppy mill, uh, regardless of the number of animals. Mm, interesting. Yeah, I feel like some people just don't know what they don't know. So it's yeah. really, it's really good to hear from you. Um, you know, there is not a standard across the board, but are there characteristics to look out for when you're, if you do, you know, look to uh, adopt uh, a, a puppy? Are there oh, definitely. Are uh, definitely. We always recommend that people meet the breeder in person and mm -hmm. see where the dogs are, are raised and where, how the mother dogs and the father dogs are kept. Uh, now, some breeders won't have the father dog because they, you know, they may just have the mother and, and the mother might have just met the father for breeding. Um, but at least see where the mother dog is living. And if she's living like somebody's pet and um, you see a, a clean house and um, good conditions and the uh, the breeder is able to provide you with detailed veterinary records, not just veterinary records of shot, a list of shots she says she gave herself, but veterinary records on letterhead from a vet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, then, you know, it, it may be uh, a decent place to buy a puppy, but if you go to see a, um, a breeder and they want to meet you in at a gas station parking lot or, or you do go to their operation and, and the, ca the, the place is just filled with cages, um, you know, think about where the mother dog is living and is that really um, a humane place um, for a dog to be living? Because your, your puppy may have only been there for two months before he or she was sold, but the mother dog is there her entire life. Yeah, for sure. I feel like, you know, if the, the person you're buying a dog from suggests that you, you make the transaction in a space that could also be a transaction where you buy heroin, yeah. That's a good sign not to go there. Don't go to that place. Uh, that's, that's a good one, Carrie. I'm going to use that. Uh, yeah. yeah. Don't buy a dog in a parking don't, lot. Don't meet in the parking yeah. lot. It's, yeah. Um, yeah. Solidly it's not a no. good situation. And my mind is even more boggled when you have these online purchases where you don't even mm. the the breeder at all, or you don't meet anybody involved. You just get them shipped or something like that. That just seems like a huge red flag. It, in some cases, people don't even ship them. I mean, there's a there's a big business in just promising puppies and taking people's money and then never shipping them. So don't, don't buy a puppy online. You're, you either you're going to be ripped off or you're probably supporting a puppy mill. And uh, the same thing goes for pet stores, of course, because this is how people hide the true nature of their business by by selling through a beautiful looking website or a mm. clean looking pet store. Um, if you're not meeting the breeder, um, there's a problem there because a good breeder wants to meet the people who are taking home her puppies. Right. Yeah, there are so many websites out there. I, I, I researched this a while ago and it's just disturbing. You know, you can find stock images of almost anything in the world. And so it's so easy to go out there and find like stock images of happy dogs romping on green grass and with their happy families. And it's very easy to just take that photo and slap it on your website when in fact you have, you know, 16 dogs and a tiny chicken coop in the backyard and, and there's nobody stopping you from that and there's no one testing aside from the consumer to do to do sort of like the the due diligence they need to do around where their animals are coming from right so actually one of our investigators went undercover uh, to a horrible puppy mill one time where there were hundreds of dogs kept in cages in a barn and while she was there she saw 
a chair, like a sort of an upholstered chair in the corner with a pretty little afghan thrown over it. And she said, oh, who, what is that? And, and the breeder said, well, that's where I take my photos for the website. Wow. She would take the puppies out of this horrible, dirty little cage, fluff them up a little bit, and put them on the chair with the pretty little afghan that looks like grandma knit it. And wow. take the picture Amazing. and then put them back in the cage. Wow, it's like an Instagram influencer. It's, yeah. it's fantastic. You know, you make everything look beautiful in the tiny little spot that you're in. In the, in the filth of everything else, get a little ring light. Yep. Going, you're going to look, yeah, great. Um, well, so, okay, so this is helping the consumer um, have a little bit more firing power and understanding and empowerment when they're going to, um, you know, make and, and take a look at, at, these, at these puppies or, or these dogs. Um, but I'm, you know, we're seeing that the retailers themselves are getting a lot smarter as well. So what kind of answers are our pet stores giving when consumers say is this are you selling puppy mill dogs or or what are yeah what are some of the practices that they've been using right typically when people go in to buy a puppy and they ask about the breeder or is this dog from a puppy mill the pet store staff are trained to say all our puppies are from class a usda licensed breeders mm -hmm. uh, well class a isn't what you would think it's not a grade um, the, the A license is just a type of license that pet breeders are required to get from USDA to sell to pet stores. So it, it basically means, it's like saying I have a driver's license that makes me a wonderful driver. Uh, yeah, no, there's doesn't. no class F breeder. Uh, right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so unfortunately, people do rely a lot on, on the, what they think is a USDA stamp of approval. And one of the things that our Horrible 100 report proves is that uh, USDA is doing a terrible job inspecting puppy mills. Um, they are going out there perhaps and once in a while writing down a citation, but um, in many cases they're, they're not shutting them down. Even when they find horrible violations year after year, uh, what we're finding is that it's just, it's barely even a tap on the wrist. Um, USDA is automatically relicensing everybody every year. Um, they have not revoked a single breeder license since 2018. Wow. Wow. Whoa. Two years, amazing. Two years in which, in which part of this was off the radar, right? Because the inspections were pulled too. Right. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. So Kathleen, we mentioned a little bit earlier talking about uh, consumers buying from pet stores um, and one of the larger retailers out there nationally is Petland. So can you talk a little bit more about um, Petland, some of the investigations that we've done and, and things that we, find, that we found out about them? Sure. Uh, Petland is the largest chain of puppy selling pet stores in the U.S. And unfortunately, we have found them buying from some pretty bad breeders, uh, including some people in our Horrible 100 report. Uh, but in addition, we've had undercover investigations of eight different Petland stores over the last um, year or two. And we've found a lot of problems with the system. Um, there the animals are coming in off of trucks. They've been on these trucks for days, sometimes 50 to 100 animals in a truck. Um, they're coming in dirty and sick. And um, one of the most upsetting things we found during our investigations is that even when the puppies are sick in the store, they're not getting professional veterinary care. They're, yes, there's a veterinarian that goes to the store and signs paperwork for them and glances at the dogs. Um, we, We've even filmed them doing 30 second examinations of each dog, but they're not, they're not testing and treating dogs for illnesses, even when they have symptoms. Um, in one of our recent investigations, for example, there was a puppy having um, bloody diarrhea for weeks. And uh, we know because we had somebody working in the store and um, instead of going to the vet, they were sort of giving him medications that they had on hand in the cabinet and he wasn't getting better. And um, instead of taking him to a vet, they sold him to our undercover shopper. And we took him immediately to our own vet where we found out that he tested positive for Campylobacter and Giardia, which are two diseases that um, are very, um, make the animal feel miserable, but they're also contagious to humans. Didn't our own investigator get sick on one of these investigations? Uh, two of our investigators got Campylobacter wow. while working at Petland. Um, and the CDC has twice investigated Petland for outbreaks of a special drug-resistant form of Campylobacter 
that made um, more than 150 people sick. Wow. That's certainly germane right now in these, this day and age as we're locked into our houses. Yes. yes. Yeah, that's interesting about Petland. I mean, so many of the sort of larger pet retailers have stopped selling cats and dogs. It's one of the reasons that I don't buy pet supplies from them. I mean, you know, there are other places to go and you can go to like local stores that are just selling pet supplies rather than selling animals when there are wonderful animals right down the street of the animal shelter. Right, absolutely. I mean, we, we need pet stores. We love pet stores for our pet supplies, but they don't need to sell puppies. So other than Congress, is there any checks and balances on USDA? It seems like, you know, I don't want to talk too out of line, but, you know, it, what's being checked on that front? USDA, the, the leadership right now at USDA has decided that education, um, you know, we don't need to cite anyone or find anyone. We'll just educate them. Um, it, that doesn't work. Uh, it's been proven time and time again uh, that, uh, you know, every time you cite somebody, there's a, there's a little notation on the inspection report, this is what you did wrong, this is the, is the regulation that you violated. So, um, you know, that's already part of the process. Um, but right now, the USDA, and to be honest, they never did a great job inspecting puppy mills, but now it's even worse. Um, they used to revoke licenses, they used to fine people, um, they used to suspend licenses. Um, none of that has been happening for the past couple of years. Um, so you just, unfortunately, we just can't rely on them to do their job right now. Um, hopefully there will be new leadership at some point. Um, but uh, the, the public really has to do their own research. And um, that's why you need to meet a breeder in person if you're going to a breeder. And of mm -hmm. course, uh, you know, we always suggest that people go to a shelter first or a breed rescue. And, um, and, and see some of the wonderful dogs that are up for adoption first before they decide to buy a puppy. Mm -hmm. Kathleen, one of the things I wanted to ask you about regarding the Horrible 100 report, I know that um, sort of every year you, you go through and you can document these conditions that are found in different puppy mills around the country. Um, and some of the conditions are really, really pretty shocking. But one thing that I was curious about, do, do you guys use this, this report to kind of delineate trends, like to tell are some states getting better or some states getting worse? And are there any trends that sort of came out of this year's that you can share? Uh, definitely. We, um, we, we do notice every year that Missouri has more puppy mills in the report than any other state. Um, it's a little tricky sometimes, though, because um, some of the, the states that aren't inspecting puppy mills at all will not have many puppy mills in the report. Right. And that's simply right. because their puppy mills are hidden and we don't have much information to go on. Um, so, it, you know, it's a little bit complicated, but um, definitely we've been able to prove that the, for example, Missouri has 30 terrible, terrible puppy mills in this year's report and, and they always come out ahead as far as the numbers. Um, it, partly it's because we have more inspection records available because they do inspect. Um, but the, the issues that we outlined in the report in detail show that there, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done in Missouri to protect dogs. It sounds like the report you guys put out might have, might have just resulted in some, some good work on that front. Although it sounds like may, maybe, maybe that was already coming, but, but you just had a closure there, right? Um, yes, the Attorney General, in, uh, just uh, Eric Schmidt in Missouri, just announced yesterday that he was... Um, making a move to shut down one of the puppy mills in our report. That's great. Um, also in recent years, he's, um, he's taken action against four other puppy mills that have been in our recent reports. So Kathleen, one of the things I wanted to ask you about is, you know, so one of the things I frequently hear people outside of the animal welfare bubble talk about when they get a puppy is they're just like, oh, my puppy has papers. They're, and they're, they've got AKC papers and they sometimes will present this to me who they, they know to be an animal welfare person as like kind of like the class A thing you were talking about. Like class A means, oh, they got an A plus and it's like, oh, we've got papers. Yeah. And right. so... Can you talk a little bit about like what papers mean and, and where they come from and, and kind of like the groups behind them? Sure, there, there's a number of different dog registry groups in the United States. And of course, the American Kennel Club, the AKC is the most well-known uh, group um, for registering purebred dogs. Uh, and basically, if you get papers with your puppy, let's say you go to Petland Pet Store and you buy a golden retriever puppy and they'll say, he comes with AKC papers. Mm -hmm. All that means is that his mother and his father were golden retrievers. And the AKC has, has logged that information in their stud books. Mm -hmm. It does not mean that he's healthy. It does not mean that he was raised in humane conditions. 
you could have bred a, a, a blind mother dog with a, a deaf father dog and, um, you know, the resulting puppies could be uh, very unhealthy and still have AKC papers. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the biggest beefs we have with AKC, even beyond that, is that they do make money every time they register puppies. So they have a financial interest in keeping um, large scale puppy mills going. And they actually have a government relations arm that fights puppy mill laws. Um, so a lot of laws that would require better conditions for dogs have been thwarted because the AKC fights them. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. I, I remember doing some research on this a while back, and there was there was a period where you had some breeders who were affiliated with the AKC trying to push back against what the AKC was doing in terms of kind of getting in the pocket of larger, big mass scale breeders, and they lost. They lost that battle, at least temporarily. I mean, we would I think we would love to see the AKC come around and be the sort of champion of dogs that they, they claim to be. Um, but right now that, that does, not, does not seem to be the case. It's a shame because we love dogs, the AKC loves dogs. Um, it would be nice to be able to meet in the middle somewhere and say, hey, let's, let's really come up with a solution for the puppy mill problem that everybody could be happy with. Um, but right now, uh, that's not where AKC is. They do not want any regulation of dog owners whatsoever. Uh, for anyone listening, what, what you mentioned a few things on what the consumers can do to be empowered, but are there any other uh, piece of advice that you would have for those who would like to help? Right, especially, sorry, especially if there are pieces of advice you have for people who happen to be living in states that are called out on the horrible hundred as particular problems, like what should those folks be doing? Well, definitely write to their elected officials or call their elected officials, tweet at your elected officials, and tell them you want better solutions to end puppy mills. Mm -hmm. um, laws against animal cruelty, laws that require better inspections. Um, and uh, there are two federal bills right now, the, the Wolf Act and the Puppy Protection Act, um, that people can also ask their lawmakers to support and sign on to. All right. Uh, well, Kathleen, thank you so much for uh, chatting with us. Um, really, really appreciate you have, ha having you on the show to discuss the Horrible 100 report most recently that has just been uh, released. Yes, and uh, congratulations on it being really the Horrible 99 now. Oh, oh. thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, again, Kathleen Summers, Director of Outreach and Research for the Stop Puppy Mills campaign at the Humane Society of the United States. That's all we have for today's show. Be sure to follow the HSUS and HSI on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and the website humanesociety.org for the latest info. You can also message podcast at humanesociety.org and send us your reactions, questions you have, and topics that you want to hear for the next episode. See you all next time on Humane Voices. Stay safe, everyone. <laughs>